Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFAL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the 13th session of our VR, XR training and education, knowledge and experience sharing speaker series presented in collaboration with the Dexar Lab at York University. I will begin today with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tukaranto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event and our participants may be joining from various locations, I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Ahmad Mohammadi. Dr. Ahmad Mohammadi is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Civil Engineering at York University in Toronto, Ontario, where he received his PhD in Transportation Engineering. His research focuses on applications of virtual reality in transportation safety, traffic conflict analysis, and traffic microsimulation modeling. His research contributes to improving transportation safety and efficiency. Ahmad is also the coordinator of Disaster and Emergency Extended Virtual Reality Laboratory, or DEXAR Lab, at York University. Dr. Mohammadi, thank you very much for your ongoing support with this series, for moderating today's session. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, you're muted. Hello everyone, sorry for the technical issue I am facing these days with my PC. So uh, welcome back to another VR and AR session today. So uh, today we, we have another uh, professor who will share his experiences about how he's implementing VR in Georgian college. So uh, let me introduce Rob. A trio, uh, who is the immersive uh, technology manager for Georgia, Georgian College, after introducing VR into the Promedic program and helping to create a VR hub in the library, Rob was asked to lead the exploration and integration of VR for Georgian College in seven campuses. Also, uh, uh, I should add that. Uh, uh, the Georgian College is uh, regarded as one of the world leaders in XCAR uh, spaces because of uh, it has 400 VR headsets, which is a lot right now, and it uh, contains five programs and considering to open 20 other programs. Uh, so Rob also has the Master of Educational technology from the University of British Columbia. He is a uh, publisher, published author, researcher, blogger, and podcaster, and the recipient of Virtual World Society's Next Stand Educator Prize as a global thought leader in the uh, VR and AR spaces. So then uh, it's time to pass the session to Rob. Please, Rob, thank you. You are also muted, Roy. Yeah. Please. Thanks very much for the, for the introduction. That's too funny. Uh, it's amazing how you know, spend so much time on synchronous online learning platforms and still you forget to unmute yourself. I probably do it once a week. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm really um, happy to be here to talk about uh, what we're doing at, at Georgian College. We've we've taken a bit of a different approach from many colleges and universities in in that 
Um, other schools oftentimes leverage the talents of their XR development students, create something, beta test it, maybe research it, and then look at integration into curriculum. I really, when I was um, given this role, I really wanted to get uh, XR and particularly virtual reality into the hands of as many teachers as possible. So we um, used off the shelf products for the most part. And and um, so that's why we've been able to explore and integrate uh, virtual reality in particular in, in about nine programs now and three departments. And we're exploring in, uh, over 20 uh, and the number keeps keeps growing. It's actually reached the point now where I spend less time reaching out to educators who I know to be innovators and early adopters and teachers are coming to me and saying, what, what can we do um, in the way of immersive learning? <clears throat> But I, I should also add the caveat that um, I'm a skeptic and uh, I strongly believe in evidence-based uh, education, not just sort of seeking opportunities to provide a solution where a solution maybe isn't necessary, where an analog alternative is more than adequate, in fact, perhaps even better. Um, so I'm when a teacher approaches me and says, could we do this in virtual reality or augmented reality? My response might be that there's a better analog alternative or you know, through discussions we might discover together there's a better analog alternative. Um, so um, with, with that, um, I'll just tell you that you know, my experience with virtual reality in particular is that it's a medium unlike any other where students can learn in the cognitive, psychomotor and affective domains and um, it provides experiential learning in a place and time for students where experiential learning may or may not have ever existed. My first experience with virtual reality was uh, a patient simulation um, experience where I found myself standing in front of a patient who was struggling to breathe and I could see his chest heaving and his discolored lips from the lack of oxygen and I could hear the anxiety in his voice. And when he answered questions, he was only able to answer with five or six uh, word sentences. And I could take a stethoscope and listen to his chest. I could apply blood pressure cuff and a pulse oximeter, and I could initiate treatments and see the response to treatments. And when I left that experience, I had to spend some time alone processing what I had just seen, heard, and 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 done with my hands. And it struck me immediately that, that this form of experiential learning is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, and when I think about, I used to teach in the paramedic program, when I think about teaching paramedics, um, something like this kind of experiential learning is a lot more powerful than an anesthetizing PowerPoint slide that describes the same patient. And so I knew there was a certain level of magic to this, and I was eager to explore it. Um, but there are lots of barriers to adoption of VR, uh, not the least of which is the hardware and the tech and the software and uh, issues around accessibility. I, I won't touch on those, although we can you know, perhaps have a discussion about those uh, towards the end. But in in you know, the four years that I've been doing this, what I've really come to believe is, is that um, the future of education involves degrees of immersion and learning will be more and more experiential and will be AI assisted. And I think I've lost the view of the screen here uh, with you guys on it. So I'm only seeing the slide. So if if you have any questions or want to interrupt me, please, please go ahead. Um, sorry, we're, we're not seeing the slides. Oh, you're not. Okay, well, that's a problem. So <laughs> you were seeing the slides, though, right? Um, no, not since not since we tested it before opening. Oh, I'm I thought, sorry. I thought, I, thought, I thought you were just uh, giving an introduction. Uh, 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 my apologies. Okay, yeah, I forgot to screen share. Boy, see, there you go again, eh? <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I think you can see my slides now, correct? Yeah, we're on the first slide now. Okay, good, good, good. So yeah, as I was saying, you know, the, the more time I spend in this, the more I, I begin to think that um, education is going to become more and more an experience of uh, degrees of immersion uh, using virtual mixed or augmented reality. It'll become more and more experiential and it'll be AI assisted. Um, so 
you know, I think about Jeremy Balinson's book, Experience on Demand. Jeremy Balinson was the founding director of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University. And uh, I had the chance to visit the their Virtual Human Interaction Lab a couple of years ago. And I would say if, if you're ever in that area, um, I recommend going for a visit. And he he coined this term, the, the DICE acronym for thinking about you know, one of the lenses through which to think about virtual mix and augmented reality, and that is uh, what can what can virtual reality, as an example, do that would otherwise in the analog world be dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, or expensive? And you can add some other adjectives like dirty, dull, and difficult, impractical, inappropriate. <clears throat> and when I say inappropriate, I mean things like it would be inappropriate to take police students to a crime scene, but you can do it in virtual reality. It would be inappropriate to take fire and paramedic students to a, a motor vehicle collision, but you can do it in virtual reality. In fact, one of the things I do in virtual reality is, is uh, I show students a uh, to scale version of a car crash. And when paramedics and firefighters are at a motor vehicle collision, they're very busy trying to get access to the occupants in the car and paramedics are extricating the extricating the occupants and they have very really little time to to look at uh the the damage to the vehicle the the, the um, sort of mechanism by which the crash happened and those things are really important and in vr you can take the time and look at those things to see what what things happen in the crash that would suggest underlying serious injuries so for example patients don't always present with um, signs and symptoms or complaints of pain that would suggest underlying internal injuries. But if you see, uh, you know, a T-bone type car crash where there's actual intrusion into the motor vehicle, you can anticipate that there might be internal injuries to the, the chest, the pelvis, the abdomen. And so understanding the kinesthetics of trauma becomes really important and being able to visualize it in a, in a way with a, with a mentor who can walk around with you uh, around the, the vehicle uh, is truly beneficial in a way that previously never existed. So I want to talk briefly about augmented reality. <clears throat> and um, I was pretty enamored with augmented reality initially, but but then lost my love for augmented reality when I realized that video clips of things like the HoloLens 2, where you see this life-size anatomical structure in, in real life, wasn't what you saw at all. So with, with HoloLens 2, for example, the field of view is very small. So it, it's like looking at an anatomical structure through a business card. And if you're looking at the head and want to see the uh, the torso, you have to tilt your head down to see it. If you want to see the pelvis, you have to tilt your head further down. It's not at all a full view. But augmented reality is, is becoming increasingly interesting with headsets like the um, the Meta Pro and, and, and the uh, Meta 3 headsets where you've got a more immersive experience, a wider field of view. And I like to call this immersive augmented reality, although that term doesn't exist. But augmented reality is huge in industry. I think it's going to uh, begin to play a more important role in education. But here's some examples of where it plays a huge role in, in industry. The, the image on your left is, is an image of the Orion spacecraft and uh, a brilliant lady uh, by the name of Shelley Patterson, Peterson rather, she was uh, the head of emerging technologies and she took uh, the, the engineers uh, and staff uh, at Lougheed Martin from paper-based instructions, which was about 150 pages, to tablet-based, and then moved to augmented reality. And what AR does is it it provides overlay on the equipment and tell them tells them exactly where to drill, exactly where to put things. And they were able to reduce the work time from 12 hours to 45 minutes. And that, uh, over time and over repeated types of interventions can, can save tens of millions of dollars. And the accuracy was improved from uh, centimeters to millimeters. Um, so we're seeing that a great deal in industry. The, the image on the right is, is um, uh, referred to as remote assistant. And I think increasingly in industry, we're seeing the use of augmented reality glasses where someone at a distance is seeing the exact same thing and actually able to annotate on the user's field of view to show them exactly what wire to cut, what what connection to make. <laughs> and increasingly that, that concept of a remote assistant will begin to be replaced by um, artificial intelligence. Just as another 
industry example, um, there's a company called Fortis Construction, and they used virtual reality uh, in designing a building. And um, here are some of the numbers at a glance. So this is a 1.8 million uh, square foot data center reviewed in virtual reality, nine companies collaborating, 30 users in VR together, uh, looking at building information models or BIM models. And they were able to save about $3 million in avoided work. And that's really the magic of virtual and, and mixed reality from an industry perspective. So, um, you know, I mentioned this medical scenario in the beginning, my first experience with it. And over time, I've come to appreciate that, that you know, there are numerous um, incredible features of virtual mixed and augmented reality. But I think the three... Uh, key superpowers of virtual reality include the sense of presence, and that's a spatial presence, uh, uh, to size presence, a social presence, a visceral presence, or emotional presence. The second is context, and context is important for all subject matters, whether it's nursing students in a hospital setting or police in a in a de-escalation setting on a, on a street corner, um, or a, a, an electrician standing in front of an electrical box. And the third thing is is agency. And when you have those three superpowers, uh, you really get a, a true embodied cognition experience, and that improves memory retention and improves uh, skills acquisition. And, and you know, the, the research is still uh, in the works. There's a bit of a paucity of research in this area right now, but I think we'll see increasingly that um, virtual reality experiential learning is going to decrease the, the learning curve or or speed up the learning curve, if you will, and that may actually translate into better performance, safer performance, and perhaps even reduction in, in lab time in some instances. When I started in this role, uh, I discovered about two months later that um, a guy by the name of Costin Bianchiu from our architectural technology program had already been using virtual reality since 2018. And his students uh, to this day still design buildings in 2D and then go into a 3D environment. <clears throat> and 3D allows you to see your work to scale. And when you see it to scale, you suddenly realize the ceiling is at the wrong height or the hallway is unnecessarily wide or the spiral staircase is in the wrong place. And the software allows allows them to, for example, move the st spiral staircase to somewhere else uh, and also uh, measure the, the how it might affect the structural integrity of the building. But there's a little story that really blew me away a couple of years ago. I attended an event in virtual reality hosted by an architectural firm, and they were contracted to build a children's hospital. And what they did was they shrunk their avatars down to the height of a five-year-old so they could see the design from a child's perspective. And that clearly is not possible in the real world. The other thing that's interesting about architecture is that I think, you know, I suspect, and this is not my area of expertise, but that we might move away from um, paper-based uh, design to 3D-based design. And this is an example. Of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute the audio for this one because it's unnecessary. This is a free application that you can get on the Quest 2 or Quest 3 called Space Elevator. And even if you know nothing about interior design or architectural design, I encourage you to get it and try it. So it enables you to construct um, houses, commercial buildings in a very easy and intuitive way. Um, and you can create skyboxes and change the location and add furniture. Um, it, it, it really is quite mind blowing. Now the application, when you launch it, it goes through this meditation exercise, which I found really bizarre, but it is what it is. And uh, I had quite a, quite a bit of fun with it. It was quite impressive. So I'll just play a little bit more of this video and then we'll move to the next slide. Um, but as I say, you know, when, when I have conversations with other teachers, I'm always thinking about strong use cases. You know, if 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 what they're looking, um, the, the method they're looking to teach uh, can be done equally or better in, in an analog fashion, you know, there's really no need or nor would it be appropriate. And it might even be cost prohibitive to use virtual mixed or augmented reality. <clears throat> so uh, we'll stop that video and move on to the next slide here. Let's see here. Um, the first pilot we did with virtual reality was with our Indigenous Studies program. Um, it, it seemed to me that context would be very important for learning language 
uh, that um, our Indigenous Studies has four language courses, language in the home, the community, the workplace, and the natural environment. And it seemed to me, but um, although I'm not a language teacher, that if you were going to learn language in the home, why not do it in an actual house? And where you can have conversations in the backyard and in the house and and uh, have conversations about how you like to make your coffee in the morning and how how what you like to cook for breakfast in the language. So we 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 uh, contracted a company to build some worlds for us, and at this point they've built um, probably over twenty different worlds for us. This is language at home; it's the first one, and so you can see you can walk through the backyard and you can stand out by the barbecue and talk about what you like to barbecue. But there, there are three magical things that happen in here. One, there's a sense of presence. Students feel closer connections to their classmates in this 3D environment. Secondly, it's contextual to the learning. And thirdly, they have agency. They're able to pick up fruits, vegetables, pots, coffee pots. Uh, and, and when you can do things with your hands, you, you're more likely to remember those experiences or remember the words and sentences associated with that. Um, so we've, we've had quite a bit of success with that. In fact, we've had so much success that um, our Indigenous Studies faculty, Michelle O'Brien, who's a coordinator, and Angie King, who's a teacher, they've been approached by uh, numerous schools and agencies looking to share our worlds with us. So we formed a partnership called Indigenous, or an alliance called Indigenous Peoples in XR, where we've begun to share our worlds with other organizations. Uh, English for Academic Purposes was also interested in context, and so they use uh, the same platform that, that we use with Indigenous Studies, but we also created some digital twins using the Matterport camera. This is an example of our Georgian dining room um, where um, international students are videotaped um, speaking in English, of course, because the idea is to help improve uh, English for English as a second language students. And they can go through the dining room and, and they generally do this on a PC rather than in virtual reality, but they can go through this 3D space anytime they want uh, from their PC at home, which is, um, you know, something that previously never existed as a, as a homework assignment, assignment rather. I'm gonna to move to the, the next slide here. We have, um, at our Owen Sound campus, we have Canada's largest maritime bridge navigation simulator. It's one of the world's largest. In fact, it's a, a massive deck with wraparound video. And we have students who come from all over the world to finish the last four to eight weeks of their capstone training before they write their international exam, certification exams, um, to pilot tanker ships and cruise ships. So. When you're on a cruise ship, for example, and you you arrive close to a port, there's usually a boat that comes out and a pilot boards the bridge and and steers the ship into port because they live there, they know the waters, they know the weather, they know the obstacles, the issues. And so these pilots are essentially ship captains who who pilot multiple ships every day um, into their into their local port. But not all students who came. Uh, you know, we have a lot of students from around the world coming to Owen Sound, but not all students are able to come to Owen Sound. So what we do now is we ship out VR headsets and computers uh, to shipping companies and our ship captain instructors meet them in virtual reality and do all of the exact same hands on things uh, in virtual reality to prepare them for their certification exams. Our uh, visual arts program. Uh, just introduced 3D painting and sculpting to one of uh, a brand new course. It starts September 2024, and students are going to be learning to to 3D paint and sculpt because there's a big market opening up now for um, 3D illustrators and world builders, and so these students will have the opportunity to design virtual and augmented reality art. Um, uh, for the first time. Really excited about that. And just as a mention of a barrier, not everyone can tolerate virtual reality, so augmented reality uh, will be developed using a tablet as an example. We're also going to be using Gravity Sketch for that program, but Gravity Sketch will also be used in our industrial design degree, which is uh, planned to be launched in uh, 2025. And Gravity Sketch is a program that's used by companies like um, Nissan, Ford, Bell Helicopters, uh, Bugatti, even uh, Nike for running shoes. 
And in the automotive and the aviation industry, the design in 3D uh, has, has dramatically shortened the design time. So people from around the world, engineers and designers can get together in VR and design. And they've reduced their design time from months to weeks, and in some cases, weeks to days, saving tens of millions of dollars. So having students at, at our college uh, use 3D design platforms like Gravity Sketch is really preparing them for the future. Uh, in fact, in some cases, our students have prepared industry for the future. We have graduates from our architectural design, uh, architectural technology program, who, who've been hired by architectural firms and brought them into the 21st century by introducing them to virtual and mixed reality. Um, we, we also have, uh, we have a web design program and they approached me and they wanted to know about the metaverse. And there's a lot of speculation and hype about the metaverse. Uh, I suspect we'll see the metaverse. We, we are seeing glimpses of the metaverse now, various uh, 3D experiences, but um, I won't go into the details of what the metaverse is. But essentially, think of a, a 3D uh, web. And uh, what I kind of envision is when you go into, a, if you put on VR headsets or augmented reality headset, for example, and you go to a web browser and you see a website, um, sites will have, or some sites will have, a little VR headset icon on it. When you click on it, it'll take you into a 3D version of their retail space or a sports event or a concert. And um, this is an example of a 3D retail tail space. And you know what I what I tell companies and educators who are communicating with companies is if you're going to convert um, or add a, a 3D space for your retail don't make a digital twin of the retail space, make it larger, make it much more interesting, make it fantastical, put it on a planet, you know, 9,000 light years away with, with ringed planets visible in the distance, make it interesting because I suspect, and I'm not a business guy or a sales guy, but I suspect that when people go into a virtual retail space and they're in awe of the visual experience they're having, they're probably more excited about buying product as well. Just my guess. Um, so, uh, and as I mentioned, we, we are exploring virtual reality in a lot of uh, different areas. The, the, the image on the right is um, something called body swaps and it's, a, it's an interpersonal skills. And this is really intriguing to me because um, you can develop interpersonal skills, conflict resolution, cultural debiasing, all those kinds of things in a role playing way that, that's really difficult in the real world. Um, and their scenarios are evidence-based, they're research-based. And so uh, our peoples and culture are exploring it. Our equity, diversity, and belonging group are exploring it right now. Our business program is exploring it. And I'm really excited to see um, how, how this um, works uh, and whether it translates into change perceptions and change values and and what the students get out of it. But we've had close to 400 students go through some interpersonal scenario experiences and the vast majority of them absolutely love it and are blown away by the experience. You think about the difference between being in 3D with, with avatars that you're speaking to compared to narrated PowerPoints and it's it is, forgive the cliche, uh, a huge paradigm shift. And now with generative artificial intelligence, these conversations are gonna get increasingly interesting. Uh, on the left is tourism. We're exploring VR for tourism. We're exploring it for uh, therapeutic recreation, for events management, um, for nursing, for paramedicine, for anatomy, for uh, biotech. Um, before generative artificial intelligence, we, we uh, were using AI and voice recognition in nursing and paramedic simulations. The, the one on the top right is an interesting uh, program called Health Scholars. And uh, the student stands in front of this person who's collapsed on the ground and each of the avatars have a name tag. And the student can say, tell the avatars what to do. We'll say, you know, Aaron, can you check for a pulse? Phil, can you start chest compressions? Uh, Fatima, can you defibrillate and start an intravenous line? Ross, can you give some epinephrine? And the analytics, and this is really important, is to have analytics, provides the student and the teacher a detailed list of everything the student did, the sequence in which she did it, did she give the right drug, right dose, right time, right route, and so on. And those analytics uh, become part or 
can become part of the uh, student summative assessment. Um, there's, there's an, uh, I mentioned this here in terms of skills acquisition because I, th I think uh, you know it's an important piece of research. This was a, uh, albeit a small randomized control trial done with second year medical students to evaluate the difference between virtual reality training versus standard training. Standard training meant uh, the usual like lecture, video, text, and so on. And in performing uh, a surgical procedure, in this case, it was inserting a pin into the tibia. And they found that the percentage of steps done correctly in VR versus standard was 63% versus 25%. And the knowledge retention of the surgical instruments was in the VR group was 50% versus 11%. Again, a small uh, cohort, but pretty compelling. And, and we're seeing more and more of this kind of research. Now, just some examples of where VR has uh, not yet been successful for us. I'll, I'll use that instead of calling it a failure. <laughs> we we uh, received a grant and collaborated with seven other colleges to develop a, uh, a boiler plant simulator for our power engineering program. And it's a truly amazing simulator. Um, students have a physical boiler plant simulator and they can do all the hands-on and learn the things uh, with that and that will never be replaced. But what virtual reality brings to the education table is the ability to do things that would otherwise be dangerous. Um, you know, low water levels and excessive heat production and, and uh, to avoid those dangerous things that you can't simulate with the physical simulator. The, the image down below is for our vet tech program, and there's a company called Victory XR that has a suite of animal dissection apps, and they're really great apps. And there's an avatar there, her, uh, her name is Wendy, and she gives sort of instructions to the students on how to do the dissection, and the students do the dissection. And as you might well imagine, if you've got a class of, um, of uh, 60 students, uh, it's difficult to find 30 dead cats to dissect. Um, but in virtual reality, you can have thousands of dead cats and dissect them as often as you want and dead dogs and, and so on. Um, but the problem with this piece of software is there's no analytics with it. So there's nothing to track what the students did or the sequence in which they did it. And so it can't be used for formative or summative assessments. And uh, from my experience, students, as, as novel as virtual reality might be, students will not do virtual reality uh, experiences unless they're required to by their teacher or unless it's worth marks. Uh, because as you know, students, uh, and I've been there as a student in recent years, are overwhelmed by the workload. And so they're only going to do things, they have to triage experiences to what is going to give them marks ultimately, right? So these are some of the things you have to think about. So, uh, you know, now uh, we're starting to see more and more generative artificial intelligence included in augmented and virtual reality experiences. And uh, just for fun, I'll show you this one. This is um, Brink Traveler <clears throat> is an app you can buy on, on a Quest 2 or Quest 3, and it costs, I don't know, $20 or something. It's 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 worth buying. It takes you to uh, a variety of different <clears throat> beautiful sites around the world. And they're beta testing their generative AI um, system right now, uh, and, and it's quite a lot of fun, and I'll just play you a video in a second, but essentially um, you go to this place and you can walk around and it's photorealistic to the point where when I'm standing on the edge of that cliff, I, I my palms start to sweat <laughs> just thinking about it, so it's pretty high up, and uh, uh, when you grab the the uh, walkie-talkie, you can press the button and ask questions. So here's here's a video of me doing just that, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio. But if you can't, I'll just repeat what I said. Pulpit Rock is a sheer cliff with a flat top that resembles a preacher's pulpit. It's an iconic Norwegian landmark known for its breathtaking view, believed to have been formed centuries ago due to frost erosion that washed away all loose soil on the rock. The result is a conspicuous cliff standing high overlooking the least fjord below. But just imagine this, this is my is avatar one of the looking most around. Spectacular views in so that's my head moving which shows to my nature's side. architecture at its best. The content of what she's saying is not really important for this discussion, but 
So I'm moving closer to the edge of the cliff. <laughs> and I'm good for standing there for a few seconds, but then I have to walk back. So looking over the edge here, it's truly spectacular. And I'm selecting the walkie-talkie now. What is this location? You are currently standing at Pulpit Rock in Strand, Norway. Pulpit Rock, also known as Brekestolen, is a famous cliff with a flat top that stands 604 meters above the Lysfjorden. It offers stunning panoramic views of the surrounding fjord and is a popular hiking destination for outdoor enthusiasts. What's the distance between where I'm standing and the mountain on the other side? I'm asking for the distance between where I am and the mountain on the, the other side. The distance between Pulpit Rock, Prekestolen, and the opposite mountain on the other side of the Leesgarden is approximately 3.8 kilometers. The view from Pulpit Rock provides a breathtaking perspective of the fjord and the surrounding mountains. Next, I want to know why there's no why barrier. Why there no barriers? natural beauty of Pulpit Rock is preserved by not having barriers along the edge. Visitors are encouraged to be cautious and stay away from the cliff's edge to ensure their safety. The lack of barriers allows people to experience the raw and untouched nature of the cliff while being responsible and mindful of their surroundings. Have any tourists died falling off the edge? So, <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Um, let me just close this off here second so i i um i don't know if you heard me but i asked uh, you know why there was no barrier and um the ai gave a good explanation and then i asked if any tourists fall fallen off the edge and the ai uh could not give me an answer so uh, they gave me you know kind of a classic we're unable to provide that information but however we advise caution around the edges <laughs> so uh, I thought that was quite funny. So, you, you know, one of the, uh, I'm, I'm really interested now and in, and I've uh, submitted a proposal to see if I can recruit some students in artificial intelligence and big data programs to work on a project with me to develop an, uh, an intelligent tutoring, tutoring system leveraging artificial intelligence and augmented reality. And what I kind of envision is is doing something kind of in the low hanging fruit area, uh, using an anatomical model, where um, the student will be able to stand in front of the anatomical model with AI enabled augmented reality glasses and ask the AI, you know, what point at a structure and ask what is this structure, and the AI will answer that's the liver. And they'll ask, how large is the liver? How much does the liver weigh? What is the function of the liver? Um, and the AI will be trained to do that. And, and this will be based on the learning outcomes of that specific anatomy and physiology course. But uh, there are two other things that are critically important to me for an, intel an intelligent tutoring system um, that go beyond information. Um, to me, information is not good pedagogy. Information is 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 as good as the information you get from your GPS. So if if your GPS guides you to your friend's house uh, for four or five trips, and then on the fifth trip your GPS fails and you don't have your phone with you, good luck finding your friend's house, right? So the the intelligent tutoring systems need to inform you, but also ask you questions, but also interrogate you in a Socratic method. Um, so you're not just, it's not just evaluating what you know, what you understand, what you can apply, but also your higher order thinking skills. So what I envision, for example, is, is that um, AI would ask you, you, you know, what are the implications of a fracture of the first rib? And as a student, you would say something like, um, the first rib comes off the top of the, the sternum and makes a sharp turn and is tucked underneath the clavicle. And so it takes a great deal of uh, force or trauma to fracture the first rib. And the clinical implication of that is that 
the clinician should suspect significant underlying injuries with a fracture of the first rib when they see it on an x-ray, injuries to the lungs, injuries to the mediastinal structures. So it's that kind of higher order thinking that I think needs to be incorporated into an intelligent tuning system. But more importantly, or equally importantly, is the analytics that it will provide. Uh, because what I envision is that more and more students are going to use intelligent tutoring systems, whether high, whether colleges, or universities support it, drive it or not. And we want to be able to uh, leverage that intelligent tutoring system to provide the teacher with feedback on what the student learned and what they comprehend and what they can apply and 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 their critical decision making skills. So, and I think. You know, in my mind, that frees up the teacher to do more nuanced teaching and more case-based learning and more project-based learning, while the AI uh, does the 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 heavy lifting at, at the other levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So, um, my my thought is that is that the future um, slide here. The future, I think, we're going to see increasing degrees of immersion in learning. Uh, learning is going to become more experiential. It's going to be AI assisted. And I really think that we're at a blockbuster moment in education where things like the written test and the take home written assignment are going to become a thing of the past. And we're going to leverage uh, immersive experiential learning with artificial intelligence to completely change the way students learn and the way learning is assessed and have teachers spending more time in the classroom with smaller groups doing things like case-based learning and uh, helping them understand the nuances of learning or both, both what you do in the field and how you connect with people and relate to people and work in teams and those kinds of things. So I'm excited to see what's going to come. I think, you know, Technology is is at the early stage of the exponential curve, and of course, as humans, we have great difficulty adapting to change, uh, and we'll never ever be able to keep up with the pace of um, technological change. Uh, but I think we need to try, and we need to to try in a way that takes one step at a time. So, with that, um, thank you very much for inviting me, and happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for the great presentation. So uh, if anyone has a question, then uh, ask in the chat. So in the meantime, I can ask one question. Is uh, I have a, this is a question, the personal question I have in my mind is, I was doing a PhD also in back of my home and then another PhD here, and uh, also master, undergrad. So during this student life per se, Rob, uh, I have never ever could attention in a class more than maybe 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. From one hour and a half, I had this issue that I, I couldn't concentrate on the course materials, right? Uh, there were several reasons. One maybe was my problem, but there are a couple of reasons is professors come and then it's a 2D uh, PDF that they just show, right? Mm -hmm. And then they are just speak about, let's say this is slide one, and then it's all about it. Even if it's a very practical course, automatically turn to a very dry course because it's 2D and not immersive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it will lose a lot of attentions uh, for this. So my question is now, do you think, because you have done the before and after implementation of VR in your courses, so can you make some examples of how is the student's attention in terms of uh, this before and after. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's it's a great question, and um, you know, I think there's there's lots of research to inform the answer to that question. Um, but you know, cognitive load, for example, has been a, a problem in learning for millennia, and um, lectures have never been a good pedagogy. 
Um, now, some people lecture better than others and use a Socratic method and really engage their students and ask them questions and dig deeper. And those teachers are, you know, much more effective than people who just stand and lecture and, and talk about various concepts one after another. But all of us, uh, you know, even the most brilliant um, people in academia have uh, a limit. And, and so, um, you know, we... We've been talking about this in education forever. Um, you'll notice that in my slides, I have very little text. It's mostly image because um, if you present a slide with five bullet points and four or five words with each bullet, uh, participants will be reading your slide text and not listening to you, right? Because of our cognitive load. <clears throat> the research around virtual reality would suggest that you shouldn't spend more than about 20 to 30 minutes maximum of virtual reality because of cognitive load. Um, you know, the principles of education are such that um, student-centered learning is better than lectures where students are doing activities, discussing, debating, doing things with their hands. We know that. Um, the interesting thing about virtual mixed and augmented reality now is that the more advanced headsets uh, employ biometrics like, um, you know, uh, gaze, um, gaze tracking and pupillometry and, and pulse and respirations and facial expressions. And you can add galvanic skin sense to that. And we can begin to quantify cognitive load. We can also begin to quantify um, stress levels and we can start to better understand, you know, when students individually hit their cognitive load and, and what their stress levels are and begin to, you know, because you're, you're, area of expertise is emergency management and my background is in paramedicine um, that really excites me that this idea that we might be able to scaffold learning in such a way that we can uh, measure stress levels and actually begin to, to scaffold the learning so that we build stress resilience into the learning mm -hmm. uh, but but you know on the on the lecture piece uh yeah i think i think the answer is less lecturing and more doing and XR and AI might just give us exactly the opportunity that we're looking for as educators to, to uh, inform and question students uh, to cover off the key things, and then we can spend more time with them doing case-based learning. I think about, you know, uh, University of Toronto has close to 20,000 students signing up for Psych 101, and it's broken up into multiple divisions, and there are probably 20 professors teaching psych 101. I don't, I honestly don't know the number. Maybe, maybe someone here is from the University of Toronto and knows, but, but imagine, uh, you know, that all of the, the information is addressed through uh, VR, AR, and AI, and, and the, the lecture dies, and the teacher can spend more time with small groups um, doing case-based learning and, and talking at, at the, the mm -hmm. practical level. Um, that's pretty exciting. I uh, hope that answered your question. Okay, so and we have another question from Stefan. Uh, what kind of technical or IT admin support is required to build VR into a course program? <clears throat> so we're, you know, um, we're using a number of technologies. We're using mostly the Quest 2. We still have some original quests. Uh, we are using uh, uh, the Vive Focus 3, the Vive Pro, the Vive Pro I. Um, we're always exploring headsets. And if I find um, content is a bit of a concern because um, the Meta headsets have by, have by far the most content. So they're the one most used by colleges and universities. Uh, and Meta is, uh, sorry to say, not very education friendly at, at this point. Um, so we, we, just as an example, we deploy headsets in, in one of three ways, and we get uh, some help from our IT department to do that. We, we either put multiple headsets on a single developer account, uh, in which case we can only sideload content. Uh, we'll also create multiple email addresses from the college to create individual Meta accounts on certain headsets. Uh, for example, for our biotech degree and for my immersive tech department, and that enables us to purchase uh, software from the storefront, 
Um, for example, Gravity Sketch cannot be side loaded. It has to be uh, purchased from the storefront. So you have to have individual meta accounts on headsets. And the third way we deploy headsets is if a student is going to be taking a headset home for a semester or two, like our Indigenous Studies and our Visual Arts, um, we we simply give them the headset with the uh, a written understanding between us and them that they would have to create their own meta account, and we you know give them some guidelines around how to use the headset. They keep it for a semester. They download whatever they want on it, and then we, we take the headset back and we factory reset the headset and redeploy it. Um, so uh, it it it's early days. Um, some people say, oh, we'll go to a bring your own device. Um, stage at some point and i would say we're a good 10 years or more before we ever get to bring your own device i'm not even sure we'll ever get to bring your own device you know anyone in enterprise who thinks that the vr headset is going to replace the phone or the tablet or the computer um i'm skeptical uh even with the vive um vision pro or sorry the uh the apple vision pro as as much hype as it's getting right now i'm skeptical that we'll replace a, a pc with something on your face but but we'll see. Yes, so and the follow-up question, Stefan, is as what type of softwares are available to create a VR simulation for courses that currently don't have this in their syllabus? Yeah, we we don't create. Um sorry, that's my answer. Um we we buy off the shelf products that already exist, so we don't develop anything. And you know, uh my my focus as a as an educational technologist and assisting other teachers is you know, I have no expectation on the part of teachers to develop anything. Um, teachers are content experts, and you know there may be one to three percent of teachers who become experts in video production and VR creation and things like that. But I, um, so I, I don't even look for for creation tools. Uh, we just buy off the shelf products, and if we get grants and are able to develop something with a third party, which we've done three or four times now, um, then we'll do that uh, specific to a need. Um, but other than that, I don't I don't look for creation products. And and VR is not intuitive. I can tell you that. You know, uh, we are a staff of two. Myself, I have an XR um, support and development specialist, and he and I will take 15 headsets to an interior design class, and we'll we'll get the headset set up, create the digital guardian, launch the program, have the students just put the headset on because it's not intuitive. And eventually, you know, we'll get teachers who understand the um, the the hardware and the software to the point where they can do that for their students. But right now, we're doing a lot of hand holding. Uh, so, Rob, one question is, uh, we are uh, mostly talking about the positive sides of VR in our presentation oh, yeah. and we are promoting it. But if I want to ask you to share your experiences about maybe one or two examples of students' feedback from a negative side, so what are the, those points that you can say? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good example. So most of the virtual reality experiences we provide for students are called room scale, where we set up a eight by eight foot or 10 by 10 foot space. They put on a VR headset, they do things, they're walking around, maybe they're teleporting to get to greater distances. We, we haven't had a student yet who's experienced motion sickness in a room scale experience. But when we use, um, a social VR platform like Engage or other social VR platforms, typically the students are in a sitting position and their avatar is moving. And when you're sitting, when you're stationary and your avatar is moving, that disconnect causes motion sickness for about 30% of the population. And that's that's definitely problematic. There are a lot of barriers uh, right now towards um, XR adoption, including, you know, if you've got wide um, glass lenses, they may not fit into a headset. We have not found a head strap that'll accommodate a student with a turban or someone with large hair. Uh, and, and so there are lots of barriers and problems, issues with equity and accessibility. Um, but we're, I'm exploring this because I believe uh, I'm, I'm really convinced that the power of this medium is, is big. And uh, I think it's, important as educators to explore this in the early days to get an understanding of its pedagogical strengths and shortcomings and the technology will improve the headsets 
will get lighter, they'll get more comfortable, the, the, you know, the problem with motion sickness will probably get addressed in some interesting way. Um, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, for example, is doing some really interesting uh, research around motion. Um, I'd like to have like an omnidirectional floor set of floor tiles where I can just walk places in virtual reality. So I'm getting I'm getting a learning experience and I'm getting fit simultaneously. I'm not sitting on my bum and and having my my smartwatch remind me it's time to get up and walk, you know. And uh, and you get up and walk to the bathroom and you come back and your watch says, "Yay, you've accomplished your goal." <laughs> it's uh, my Apple Watch sets a very low standard for. Um, for getting up and getting my blood circulating. <laughs> okay, so we have we are running out of the time, but we have two more questions. Is okay. uh, again a follow up question from uh, Stefan. He, he's asking, then where do we look to see what type of programs are available? Oh. And I mean conflict resolution. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well let me. Um... Let me do two things. Let me go to the chat. And I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna post my slides. And secondly, I'm gonna, I've been curating a list of um, applications for VR experiences and they're all categorized and I'll share that as well. Give me one second here. Yep, so. Yeah, explore away. Um, in terms of interpersonal skills, body swaps and um, what's the other one? Anyway, you'll you'll see it on the list. There are a couple of uh, big ones, um, but body swaps is the one we've been using for uh, three years now, and, and uh, I really quite I like the company. Um, Christophe Mallet, uh, who is the CEO and founder of the company, he is an academic, not a sales guy, and I really like that about him. And his his company started based on research that they'd done around um, perspective taking and how um, conversations with avatars can change your perception and perceptions and values. So, a great company. Uh, okay, so one more, so. Can you share the list again? I'm not seeing uh, the list. Maybe we can send it to everyone. So that uh, yeah, it's in the. It was shared with hosts and panelists, but I I'll open the links and I'll share it with oh, everyone. Oh okay, okay. Oh yeah, I see. It's shared with host and panel. Okay. Uh, I'll just share it with everyone right now. So this is the um, the list, and let me get. I'll get my slides for you again. Yeah, I'm having trouble sharing my, oh, there we go. So, and the last question is uh, from Greg. Have you looked at an ERF or photogrammetry, polycam or reality capture for rapid 3D scene depictions? Yes. Yeah, I'm very excited about photogrammetry and Gaussian splats and um, LiDAR scanning. And we've been playing with it a little bit. It's not, it, it's not part of my mandate, but I, I have a, I have kind of a like a, a nerd club <laughs> of teachers who uh, are interested in in this kind of thing, uh, and this is really interesting from a disaster management perspective, right? Because you can do a three D scan of a city, uh, um, a lidar scan of a city, and then shrink it down to tabletop level and and uh, you know create a um, incident command uh, systems exercise that's much more visual than what you would normally have in a tabletop exercise. So yeah, I'm very interested in photogrammetry and lidar scanning and, and Gaussian splats and uh, nerfs and so on. And um, uh, I'm, I'm also hoping that, you know, uh, we can collaborate with other colleges and universities to establish a repository of free um, 3D scans uh, that we can across, share across the board because, everything in, in XR is expensive. And so if schools are developing XR experiences, I strongly encourage you to make them open source at least to other schools um, as well. Yeah, that's very nice, uh, especially for the 3D models. Yeah, it's, it's going well. 
So let's see. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So uh, with that aside, uh, I, yes, so, okay. I was just putting like the applications aside so that I can take a look afterward. So, okay, thank you very much, Rob, and all, all everyone to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, so next month also we will have another speaker. So uh, then I just pass through the Francesco to say the final words. Thank you. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Um, yeah, just to echo uh, Dr. Muhammadi's uh, thanks, I would like to thank you, of course, Rob, for that great presentation and for sharing those resources with us in the chat. Um, I have saved them myself, so if anybody that's watching um, loses them for any reason, please send me an email. I'm typing my email in the chat as well, um, and you can just ask me for them. Yeah. And people and can that... connect with me on LinkedIn if they like. Great. Um, let me just share your LinkedIn quickly then. Um, yeah, and so also just thank you again, Dr. Mahamadi, for um, moderating and for organizing the session. Thank you to everybody who attended um, and who supports this series. Um, so we appreciate your participation and your live attendance. Um, if anyone would like to review or share this presentation with anyone, please remember we do record all of our sessions and put them up on our YouTube channel. I have shared all of our social medias in the webinar chat as well. Um, and as Dr. Mohammadi mentioned this is a monthly speaker series, so the next session will be on April 26th. It is the fourth Friday of every month. Um, so please mark that down on your calendar if you're interested. Share it within your network. Registration is always open and free. Um, so with that, just one last big thank you to everybody, um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Um, and yeah, I think we can end it there. Great. Right.